Hi, my name is Marty McCary. I'm a physician at Johns Hopkins Hospital and a professor in the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. I wanna share with you a little bit about what I personally am learning about the COVID-19 infection based on the international experience. What is happening in Italy is a preview of what we can expect in the United States. Wuhan and China have not been transparent with their data and Iran has not been transparent with their data, but Italy has been very transparent. And what we are seeing is a playbook that is going to hold true in the United States short of a miracle. Italy is about two weeks ahead of the United States in terms of the spread of this. And while it may be argued that they had a higher risk of transmission given the European forms of greeting and perhaps the congested spaces that some cities have, They've also taken dramatic, dramatic moves to limit activity and to quarantine, even under martial law, their society. What we've observed just recently is a jump from approximately 90 deaths in one day about a week and a half ago to now 350 deaths per day for three consecutive days on average. And most recently, nearly 500 deaths in a single day for the most recent day for which data has been collected. Extrapolated to the United States population, that is the equivalent of approximately 2,000 people dying in the US per day at this stage. Now remember, um, Italy is approximately three to four weeks ahead of its peak. So uh, extrapolating chronology, we can anticipate that within a couple weeks, we may see over a thousand deaths per day and potentially a couple thousand deaths per day. The United States has approximately 100,000 ICU beds and roughly that many number of ventilators or respirators, be it full service or partial service. That means our entire healthcare system is about to be overrun, as we have already watched it be overrun in Italy. Now, there are two important aspects to our capacity. One is, and the one I'm most concerned about, is the risk to healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are at the highest risk of contracting the infection, and uh, healthcare workers have varying degrees of personal risk, changing their own personal case fatality rate. First of all, anyone at very high risk, anyone with a very advanced age, anybody with an organ transplant, any healthcare worker on chemotherapy or anyone with a suppressed immune system should not be showing up to the hospital. We've got to take care of our most vulnerable. It may be that younger and healthier people uh, power us through the important essential services, not just in healthcare, but in many aspects of society. We may see a double whammy of healthcare workers being either unable to work because of quarantine or unable to work because they themselves are hospitalized, and at the same time, a massive influx of patients. In the interim, <clears throat> what we need to do is expand and convert every bed that can be converted into a critical care bed into a critical care bed. That means we may need to evaluate same-day surgery centers and off-campus sites. We may need to ask ourselves how many respirators are, functionable, are functional so that if care were rationed in an ICU, the respirator would provide some lifeline. It's also important for us to think about staffing. This is a time for us to think about education and graduate medical education. This is not a time for students to be rotating on non-essential service lines. This is not a time for surgical residents to be rotating in cosmetic surgery. This is a time for all of us to ask ourselves, how can we have the, uh, be overstaffed and overprepared in those critical areas, emergency departments, wards, um, and in most importantly, our ICUs. If we look simply at some of the trends, uh, it is clear that there are some bright spots. It turns out that for most people, they develop no symptoms after getting the infection or have mild symptoms. We know it's hard for this virus to hurt someone who's very young and healthy. 
A recent report from the American Academy of Pediatrics found that there was only one reported death of a child in over 2,100 infections that were reviewed. We know that historically these pandemics are over in about three to four months. That's how long it took the Spanish flu of 1918 to pass. That's how long it took SARS and MERS. And while reinfection and some prolonged infections could be a threat, historically, the numbers favor a transient nature of these dramatic precautions. Uh, it may be time to partner with the local Army Corps of Engineers and military hospitals to build field hospitals. I know it may sound dramatic, but ultimately we have to think about how we can possibly manage a possible influx of patients ranging from 200,000 critical care patients over the next few months to over 2 million critical care level patients over the next few months with only 100,000 ICU beds. We need to think about shutting down all non-emergent services. Anything that can wait at this point should wait. In fact, some hospitals have already done this very well. But my great concern right now is that some hospitals still have the mentality that exists in the United States today that this is not a big deal. Some folks are going out to a park, which is it's okay to be outside, but they're going out to, to some activity and they're saying, hey, I'm watching folks play in the park. It's a nice day outside. Nobody I know is critically ill. I'm not seeing the carnage of this epidemic. What's the big deal? And we have to remember that it is um, young people who are the community transmitters to those who are most vulnerable. This is one of those few times in health where what you do as a young healthy person influences the health of somebody you've never met. Uh, we need to uh, clean all surfaces with alcohol-based solutions, bleach-based solutions, or simple soap and water. That includes phones. Phones are one of the most common ways that we communicate in hospitals. It's also a common mode of transportation. Um, and we need to send a strong message that if somebody is sick out there and has mild or moderate symptoms, we don't want them in our hospitals and we don't want them in our clinics. At the same time, if anyone has worsening symptoms that are progressing rapidly, symptoms they personally feel they can't manage at home, if they feel that there's a risk to their life, or most importantly, if they are having any trouble breathing, they should be told to go straight to an emergency room. Uh, there are some hopes that a medication can help us. Let's hope that as we increase capacity, certain antivirals, certain anti-ARDS medications, and ultimately, most likely after this pandemic, a vaccine may help reduce the burden on hospitals and clinics. But for now, what is the danger of being overprepared and looking back and saying that was not quite as dramatic or severe as the projections implied. No country has been immune to this problem. And even when we look at results from the Johns Hopkins uh, tracker, it is clear that when you look at these numbers, they are simply representing a trend. It's important for people to know, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Johns Hopkins team who developed this map, but instead as an academic who can tell you from talking to doctors in Italy, China, and all over the United States, that confirmed cases are not total cases, and that confirmed deaths are not total deaths. Probably the real number of deaths from COVID-19 is 10 to 50 times higher than the reported numbers that routinely get cited by public health officials, governments, and the news agencies. Remember, many patients are coming in with what we call inf influenza-like illness and ILI-related deaths are presumed to be COVID-19 deaths by many of the practitioners that take care of these individuals. So we should uh, not find false assurance in numbers. For example, a statistic that only 60 people in the United States have died from COVID-19. Not true. Only 60 patients who have died within, with influenza-like illness 
who have also been tested and tested positive, um, uh, were tested positive for COVID-19. Many of the numbers and statistics are simply a function of our capacity to test. And as we progress further and further down uh, the decline after the peak of this epidemic, the testing phase uh, will be something that will have less relevance. In other words, testing is most relevant for early tracing and isolation and less relevant at the tail end of a pandemic. What do we do when one in two Americans test positive for the infection? Do we tell them to avoid any other person or to presume everybody has the infection? Well, those are probably good guidelines uh, to issue uh, without the test. That is, it is good to presume that any person may in fact have the infection and that we should take all precautions with anybody that we're in touch with. So those are some thoughts on the COVID-19 situation. As things develop, um, as we're tracking them very closely, there will be more updates. But in the interim, keep in mind the importance of getting everybody on the same page. A recent survey suggested that only 60% of Americans thought that the infection will get worse. That means 40% of folks still have not come to grips with the actual data. This is not fantasy football, and this is not political opinion. These are facts, and these are data, and they are telling us to, to act, and we have to listen to those data. What's happening in Italy is a preview of what's to come, and I think the best thing we can do right now is to plan to increase our capacity.